Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come in, come in, make yourself at home, pull up a chair, pour yourself a beer. Uh, welcome to this evening's Live with Littlewood with me, Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the IEA. We've got an hour with a stellar panel of guests to take a freedom-loving look at unfolding events in our increasingly unfree world. Coming up later on tonight's show, I'll be joined by Brendan O'Neill, editor of Spiked, uh, our very own Saeed Kamal, the acting academic and research director here at the IA, and for her debut on the show, Emma Webb, deputy research director at the Free Speech Union. Uh, we'll be discussing Back to the Future. Do we really think restrictions are going to come to an end on the 21st of June? Will normality actually resume, or is there no going back to the old normal? Uh, will the road out of lockdown be blocked and changed and bypassed like so many times before? And what is the data really telling us now about COVID vaccination rates and the scale of the pandemic problem we face here in the UK? Uh, towards the end of the show, we're also going to be discussing the findings of the report released last week by the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities that concluded there was no evidence of institutional racism in the UK. We'll be discussing all things wokery, I guess. Was the report correct? Is the UK actually racist in any meaningful way? And following news stories from Monday, that new guidance is urging nurseries to teach kids to understand white privilege, I'll be asking if that really is the best approach for ending racism amongst the toddler community. Uh, but that's all to come later in the programme. Before then, I'm absolutely be delighted to be joined by my opposite number at the Centre for Policy Studies, Robert Colville. Robert, good evening to you. Welcome back to the good show. Evening, Great to have you with us. And also a warm welcome back to Suzanne Evans, journalist and director of political insight, all round commentator and good egg. How are you, Suzanne? I'm very well, thank you, Mark. Great to see you. Good to have you with us. Good to have you with us. Well, I, I want to start off on the the vaccine passports, the COVID certification issue. Papers, please. Um, are these passports going to come? Are they in any way necessary? Are they remotely practical? Uh, in a scientifically robust poll organised by the IEA on Instagram, uh, we found that of those who chose to vote on our Instagram poll, 88% of people were against vaccination or immunity passports, but the government seems to be seriously weighing up whether we're going to bring them in. Uh, Robert, tell me your thoughts on this. Is it right for the government to be even considering this? We've heard uh, in the last few hours that the US government will not consider it. Uh, should we see this as a shocking attack on our civil liberties? Or should folk like you and I say, as Boris Johnson said, you know, it's sort of up to the private owner of a private place. And if a pub landlord wants to have a certain admissions policy, up to the pub landlord. What's your take on it, Robert? So I, 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 I feel I'm here under false pretenses because a lot of people are getting extremely angry about this. And I, I mentioned this on Twitter today and got basically like lots of people telling me like this is the first step to a police state. You know, this is China's social credit system. This is, you know, and I, I find that stuff really hard to hard to understand. Um, like this, this government is very clearly not wanting to maintain restrictions on our everyday behavior as I, as you know, um, for, uh, you know, not least because it'll destroy, you know, it's destroying the economy. Um, but, you know, uh, you, you know, I think, um, I, I think we've already, and we've already seen a pushback. Labour aren't that keen on it. Lib Dems aren't that keen on it. Um, you know, and the many Tory MPs aren't that keen on it. So I think there's a natural limit to how, how far they can go. Um, I think, so I'm sort of, personally, I'm, I'm sort of caught between two stools. I, I, I dislike the idea of the government telling us uh, that um, what we can and can't do. I, I, I dislike the idea of another, yes, another um, big government IT program which, to create yes, another separate app on our phone, which may well be outdated by the fact that the, um, the, the pandemic, uh, you know, the, va the, 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 you know, the, you know, the vaccination program may just kind of render this a non-issue that um, hopefully um, we will be in such a sort of COVID free paradise that, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of moot. But at the same time, um, I think, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I think that there's a balance to be struck here. And I think the government is kind of in the, in getting into the right place on it. Like, I don't want to have to show a like proof of vaccination to go to a pub. 
not least because that's really, really unfair on young people who are the least likely to have been vaccinated and who have suffered the most economically for a disease, you know, to stop, prevent a disease which, which mostly uh, illness, which really disproportionately affects older people. Um, but equally, I, th I think if you're talking about things like, you know, music festivals, nightclubs, uh, you know, Wembley Stadium, you know, the Euros at Wembley Stadium, where you're going to have very large numbers of people all kind of uh, mixing together, swilling beers together, um, you know, I think for things like that, yeah, there's probably a, a better case for um, immunity like um, certificates. Um, likewise, if you're going to, if you're talking about, you know, going uh, going overseas, because like one of the crucial parts of, the, of keep, you know, keeping this disease under control is obviously going to be um, making sure that we're not just, we're not sort of reimporting new new variants. OK, just before I come to Suzanne on this, though, Rob, where is your line in the sand here then? Right. I mean, forget the Euros. Southampton are playing Leicester City in the FA Cup semi-final, much, much more important event than the, than the Euros. Uh, I can only get into that if I move to Brent and start working for the NHS or the local council. I'm seriously considering that. It's one of Southampton's more important matches in recent years. But you're saying yes for big events, no for small events and going to the pub. How big would the nightclub well, have uh, to uh, be uh, or the uh, music uh, festival uh, before you need to show a certificate? As one of my colleagues was pointing out when you when, when we discussed this, what happens if you go to six pubs in one night? Uh, which I wasn't quite sure whether that was a hyper hypothetical or just like his social plan for uh, for when lockdown either. Um, but I think I think we're getting into like one of the reasons this has all been so tough. Like the we, we throughout this pandemic, we seem to have looked to the government to provide absolutely definitive answers for every single species of human behaviour. Like, and which would result in these sort of you know, 80 pages of guidance about, you know, you can be, you know, you can, you can have people, you can show people around your home, but, you know, you can't, like, you have to be sort of standing with your, with one foot in a plant pot outside if you, you know, and I, I think you know, there's going to have to, yeah, we, we're going to have to sort of come up with imperfect answers to this. And I think at this stage of the pandemic, the answers are necessarily going to be more imperfect because we're not all in it together anymore. There's large, you know, half the population have now had at least one jab. Um, and and now we've come to this sort of break point where people like me who thought we were going to be like next in line are being told actually we need to wait while everyone has their second doses. Um, you know it's not um, you know it's not it's not fair. It's it's and it's not going to be fair. And you know we need to to, to, to work out what we can do to minimise the amount of unfairness. But equally, I, I I don't think like preventing everyone from going to the pub just because because some people can't go to the pub that's not a solution either. Suzanne, what's your take on this? Uh, have you had a jab yet, Suzanne? No, I, I, I haven't. And I think I'm in the camp that probably isn't going to have one, to be honest. Um, long, long reasons for that, which I won't go into now. But as far as vaccine passports are concerned, I wish I shared Rob's optimism, really, that the government is doing what's right for us. Um, I find it quite alarming, actually, that the government has consistently told us that they were not going to consider vaccine passports. Um, we had um, ministers giving evidence to the Science and Technology Committee saying that they were not going to be vaccine passports. We had Michael Gove go on the television and say there wouldn't be vaccine passports. And some of us were saying, well, hang on a minute, then in which case, why have you put the contract for these out to tender, which, which they had? And now, sure enough, here they come. Vaccine passports are being actively considered by the government for our own safety. Now, the policy is also nonsensical. Even if you take aside the enormous imposition on our civil liberties, on our human rights, the policy simply doesn't make sense. We had no vaccine passports this time last year um, when there were more people dying of COVID and we had more daily cases. Uh, what is the point of having a vaccine passport, as you suggested, Rob, to go to Wembley? Um, but no vaccine passport to go on a crowded train to get to Wembley. The whole thing is utterly nonsensical. I, right from the word go, I was increasingly concerned that, that we were copying communist China. In communist China, you know, order, control, authoritarianism, a dictatorship is the order of the day. And we kind of followed that model and went with it without any consideration really simply because everybody else was doing it and there wasn't enough thought like many people I went along with lockdowns at the start because we didn't quite know what kind of a disease we were dealing with maybe it was a new Ebola a new yellow fever something that was seriously going to decimate the population but it very quickly became clear that there was a specific population that was at risk of this and that was the elderly and those with serious underlying health conditions and yet we carried on regardless 
far from following the science, as the prime minister and the members of SAGE told us religiously that that's what they were going to do. We ignored the science and went further and further and further down the line of authoritarianism to the point where we are now, as Mark said in his introduction to this program, it's a show us your papers society. And I think that is a serious concern. Um, I will not go to any business that wants a vaccine passport. Frankly, I think people who say, well, I have to have the vaccine and I have to get the passport if I ever want to go on holiday again. I don't think they should be throwing away their human and civil rights quite so easily, frankly. Rob, let me come back to you. I mean, a few people have already made this point in the chat. Uh, these vaccines either work or they don't. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've had my first jab. I'm happy to risk it and go to Wembley to watch my football team play in the semi-final. Quite, nobody's forcing me to go to the semi-final. I'm happy to risk it. The government won't let me go. Uh, I've had my first, don't get my second jab until June. Why, why can't people now police themselves? I mean, we're rolling out the vaccines at a very fast rate. If young people who are nervous about it don't want to go down the pub until they've had their jab in July, fine. Stay at home and drink your beer. Stay at home watching Live with Littlewood and drink your beer from home. Suits me just fine. Can't people now self-police this, Rob? Well, firstly, I'd like to investigate the network of corrupt contacts that saw the director of the IEA get his vaccine before the, before the CPS. This is a disgraceful <laughs> reliance on the state. Uh, and I, you, should be, you should be thoroughly ashamed of yourself. Um, the, I think the, I mean, two, two points there. One is that actually, like, one of the sort of weird things in, in, throughout this pandemic has been the idea that like, we all do what the government says. I think like, everyone has, like, people have been acting in their own, as, you know, according to their own estimates of their own risks. I mean, I, I think you know, it would be a brave, I, I live next to a park, it would be a brave person who would go into that park and, and say that everyone in that park has been obeying the rules throughout lockdown and, and, and will continue um, will continue to do so so I think yeah I mean people can can take you know responsibility for themselves but one of the problems I've had with quite a lot of the arguments um, from actually my fellow kind of um, people on the libertarian um, liberal liberal side one of the problems I've had with them is that, that they don't like is, this came up with mask wearing as well the idea that it was a grotesque imposition on your human rights to, to be forced to wear a mask in public. And the point was not about, it's not about you, it's about your externalities. Other people have a right not to be infected by you. Uh, by you, you what if you're not, if you're not infected, Rob? You can't infect somebody else. And I, I'm really sorry to interrupt. Well, vaccine, but vaccines don't prevent the whole infection. idea. They, would, they, reduce, it's, they eliminate it's the risk of serious, serious deaths, but they don't, they don't prevent infection. They may reduce whole, it. We, we're yeah, not quite you're, sure. You're, you're talking about Mark, this whole idea that every single one of us now walking around in this planet is a potential granny killer, a potential harbinger of some deadly disease, is, is completely at odds with how we have lived our lives throughout history. It is wrong to treat everybody like a leper, to treat people who haven't had a vaccine like an outcast. This is the kind of stuff that we have fought against for generations and that Britain has stood against when it comes to human rights around the world. We oppose the caste system in India, for instance. What is the difference between that um, which uh, a, a system which doesn't allow certain members of society to participate fully in society and this appalling idea of a vaccine passport does exactly the same thing. And Robert, don't, don't you think again that you can, I mean, don't take the risk then. Um, I'm sorry I've been able to bribe my contacts in government better than the CPS has to jump the queue. Um, I think it's actually a benefit of having been a smoker for 30 years, actually, you know, or some other high risk uh, thing on my stuff. But what, 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 what I'm, I'm not forcing the, people to go down well, the path. If you're worried about being smoke, infected, I thought don't smoking go. Was your, I thought smoking was a preventative. I thought the idea was that it got, your lungs have got such a good workout from uh, from all the fag smoke that you were... Uh... You're determined to actually prove that I got my jab due to government bribery, aren't you, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> but, but my general point, I mean, don't if you don't want to risk it, don't risk it. Everybody will be vaccinated by, I don't know what, you know, July, August, September, whatever. Uh, if you are not wanting to risk it, if you don't want to go down the pub because you're worried I'm going to infect you, don't go down the pub. Yeah, and I think I, I think that's, so. Which is which is why I think like the you know I, I think that you know it's quite it's good that we are circ circumscribing the list of things which these these things will be required, the, like the the list of impingements on freedom. But I just I, I do, but I do think like I I, I just. I, I, I struggle on this one. I struggle to, to get into the trenches. I struggle to see this as the as the first stage, as Suzanne obviously does, as the first stage in a 
or the second or third or whichever stage we're I was at. Gonna say, I don't think it's the first stage. I think the first stage started a long, long time ago. That creeping authoritarianism started actually, as, as you raised it yourself, um, uh, you raised it yourself. Um, um, oh gosh, sorry, I hope I'm still there. Somebody just tried to call me and I'm on my phone. Um, it started with masks. You know, we were told for months that masks made no difference against COVID-19. And I, I suspect that's actually right. And yet somehow suddenly we were forced to wear although, them. Although why? Although There's no evidence for it. in the US has now admitted that was because they didn't think they had enough masks and they wanted to preserve them for medical staff rather than because they actually thought it didn't make that much difference. But, that, but that's my point. Like mask wearing is... Like, uh, people got very very angry about mask wearing and very upset about it and i just thought like i, I didn't regard it as like as a sort of style as a stalinist imposition not least because it was protecting other people by doing it likewise with with, with vaccines you know the, the there's the, there is an issue of individual rights here but there's also a, a collective issue that like you need to in order for vaccines to, to, to for vaccination to work, you need you need a certain you need to get to herd immunity. You need a certain number of people who have had this to me to ensure that there is not that that pool within which the, the vaccine can spread. Okay, like in, in order to even up this boxing bout, let me kind of weigh in on Rob's side and put some oh, of the oh. challenges to to Suzanne. Um, I mean, how much really of an imposition is it, Suzanne? Sometimes to leave the country or go to a particular place. Uh, you need to have shown that you've been, you know, you've had your yellow fever jab or whatever it is, or polio, you've got to take these jab, they won't let you in. You might need to have a piece of paper in order to get there. Uh, you might need to show your credentials on returning home. I was living in Tenerife for three months and needed to go through a test before they'd let me get on the flight, a test before they'd let me into the country, stay at home for 10 days. How, how is this qualitatively different? Well, we're not talking about that, are we? I mean, I think two things in answer to that, Mark. First of all, the yellow fever argument really doesn't stand up, I'm afraid. Yellow fever is a horrible disease that kills 25% of people who get infected with it. Um, you have to have a yellow fever jab to visit just 20 countries in the entire world. Um, you'd be mad not to have a yellow fever vaccine to go to these countries. COVID isn't that. The vast majority of people will survive COVID, uh, the overwhelming majority of them with absolutely no long term effects whatsoever. It's completely incomparable, I'm afraid, to something like yellow fever. Um, and secondly, we're not talking about passports for international travel uh, or some kind of variant. We're talking about having a vaccine that has been rushed through on an emergency basis that is now, it seems to, particularly for young women, um, be potentially dangerous to, a, um, oh, admittedly, a very small minority of them, but nevertheless, there is quite clearly a danger, or it would, the AstraZeneca vaccine, for instance, wouldn't today have been withdrawn from use uh, on women under, under 30. Um, we're talking about domestic vaccine passports. We're talking about having to show your papers to go and get some fish and chips or to go to the pub or to go to a football match. There is a massive difference. I'm afraid the the, the any correlation between that and facing a real threatening risk to your health by visiting a certain country abroad and therefore sensibly taking a vaccine. It's just, it's just a facetious argument, I'm afraid. Fal fallacious argument, not facetious. I'd never call you facetious, Mark. Um, Rob, <laughs> do, do you think, put aside the civil liberties concerns, let's say folk are with you, Robert, that are uh, it, well, I, it, I, I, it's not an authoritarian issue. Throughout this pandemic, his folk have been on the like on on the on the most like the, the British public have been revealed in their authoritarian, security conscious, uh, safety first glory on this. On well, the, you uh, might say that you might say that, but the uh, my my question, Robert, is whether you think it's even practicable. Let's say that you don't have ardent, you know, libertarian concerns. It's a you might argue it's a short term feature or factor until we finally overcome the. Um, pandemic. But uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, Robert, that you weren't entirely confident that a new government IT database would necessarily work swimmingly. And you can, you can surely see, you know, the number of hurdles administratively that you've got to clear and that you could fall at, you know, pub staff are going to have to check them. Um, the track and trace system has not been without its faults. Do we really have a um, any confidence that even if you tossed aside all civil liberties and privacies concerns or believed that they were being properly addressed through the administration of the scheme, can the state apparatus genuinely deliver this? So I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, so I mean, I, th I think, um, and it's probably why, like, it won't happen. Why it's, it seems like it's probably 
not going to happen in pubs because I think that is just too much, as you say, it's too much of a, of a faff for everyone. Um, I think the part of the issue is that, um, you know, if in theory, we have now have a pretty good database of who's been vaccinated. I mean, I've, I've, I've written quite a bit on, on databases uh, recently and I was like, was talking to some of the people involved in the NHS, but like, you know, it, it, it's, it, sh it should be sort of fairly easy to, like, that status is now, it's, it's anonymized. It's not like, um, you know, no one can sort of, like no one sitting in NHS can, can check. Suzanne Evans, no, Mark Littlewood, yes. But the, you know, but you know, it, it should be possible it, to add that to, to, to your, to, you know, and there is, there is meant to be an NHS app, which we are all meant to be, getting to help give us more control of our medical records although that's been on in the pipeline for ages um so yeah i i, I, I i'm not i'm not as it should be doable but equally you know uh, you know governments are not great at this kind of thing and i you know i haven't yet seen solid evidence either way for for how this is going to work. I, know people, I know i know there are people in government who are quite skeptical about the um about this, but basically, my working theory on all this stuff is like, if there is an existing database, you can you can adapt quite quite quickly and easily. Then great. If you're having to build the list from scratch, then it's going to be a nightmare. Suzanne, let me ask you. Let park your sort of civil liberties concerns for a moment. Your privacy concerns. Your view that this just isn't a remotely acceptable thing for a liberal democracy to do. Let's just park those concerns. Do you think there's now a danger that the government's sort of using sledgehammers to fail to crack yeah. nuts? Um, mm. In the 10 weeks since late January, the seven day average daily death rate has fallen 97 percent from 1,248 a day to just 35 a day. Do you think this might end up, Suzanne, being a moot point? I mean, I'm very sorry for those 35 people and their families, but we're getting these numbers down to an extraordinarily low number. I was told yesterday, actually, that average deaths in Britain for this time of year is lower than the historical yeah, we're, we're average. About, we're, we're now about 10% under excess deaths. Um, so so why bother with any of this at all? I mean, I can understand if you're worried that, you know, half a million Brits are going to die at worst case scenario. But this is under control now, isn't it, Suzanne? Well, I think that's the point I was trying to make, really. So, for instance, you know, we've had no deaths in Wales today, but they're still in lockdown. The number of daily cases, new cases registered today was under under 2000. Um, this this is over. So why on earth is the government now bringing in ever harder hitting and more authoritarian measures? This time last year, we could leave the country and go on holiday. Uh, not anymore. We need an USSR-style USSR exit visa to uh, even go and volunteer for a charity overseas or to, to go on a business travel. Um, this is what I really struggle with, Mark. Um, and, and I know you say park your civil liberties stuff, but I, I can't really. Um, why now this disease is on the run? Are we, are we facing ever more draconian restrictions on our lives? That is what I struggle with. And, and as I've said to a few people, you know, I voted conservative, not communist. And I want the old Boris Johnson back, please. So, like, so okay, so, so my argument with that would be last, like, yeah, like, last, last year we, we could do more things. And then we got another wave of, of the disease. I, I I think it is it is striking as Suzanne would, would as you all say how the government has moved the goalposts on this. Like when lockdown was announced, it was we were told that like the number of people dying in hospital and capacity for the NHS was the key variant. And now actually, you know that's that's okay now. But we're still in we've got this very slow five week gaps between every measure. You know, data not dates, but the dates can't move forward. I I I, I get all of that um, that aspect of it. The the issue I have like what one of, I think one of the things is like. The test and trace stuff only works when, you know, when when the the body of infection within the population is low enough that you can get a great, really get hold of any outbreaks and ha and hammer down on them. Like the, the reason test, the, the the testing the tracing didn't didn't work last year was because it was just, it was everywhere. There was just no there was no point. It was anyway. And even when it was like this, even when it was actually quite low in London, it was much much higher up, up in Manchester and other places. Which you know, so we you know, so we we left lockdown sort of too too late for some and too early early for others so i think you know i think there is there is that element of it but there's also like we're not becoming more authoritarian like this is about the speed at which we can unlock like you know it, it, you know like you know, I, I, there are things i want to do we all want to do like go to the pub have, you know, have picnics, like go go temp in bowling whatever you know sit in a cinema or whatever your whatever your thing is you know you know anything which helps that happen more quickly i'm, I'm you know i'm instinctively in in favor of 
Okay, you know, Robert, well, I'd, I'd be more inclined to agree with you if the policies were logical, but they are not logical. Uh, you know, why can you only go for a care home visit a half an hour? Does the virus respect a half hour time window? Why do you have to walk one way around a supermarket? Does the virus know what the system is? You know, why do you have to sense. wear a mask when you're standing up in a restaurant but not sitting down? The whole thing. You know, I've done policy for, for quite a, most of my political career. I have never in my lifetime seen policy development that has been so insane. It, it, it really is insane. There's no other word for it. Rob and uh, Suzanne, stay with us. Uh, I understand we, can, we now managed to get Brendan O'Neill, editor of Spiked, uh, to join us. Uh, a warm welcome back to the show to Brendan. I'd just like to get his thoughts on these passports, both from a, an efficacy point of view and from uh, a civil liberties point of view. I think it's not yet known whether they'll come in. I was doing the maths and Apparently, there are about 40 Conservative named rebels at the moment. The Conservative majority is 80. But then I see today, actually, the Scottish National Party would probably support the government, thereby um, wiping out the, uh, uh, the, the Conservative rebellion. Brendan, good to have you uh, with us. Thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thanks, Mark. What's your take on this passports thing? Are we going to get them if we do get them? A, will they work? And B, even if they were to work, are they an unacceptable intrusion into our civil liberties and privacy? It's looking like we are going to get them. It's become a kind of fait accompli at the moment, um, which is really outrageous because so many ministers said that they wouldn't happen. And people like Boris Johnson have been arguing against ID cards for a very long time. So this is a real massive backtrack on their part. And if we do get them, it will be a disaster for freedom. There's no question about that. And for me, the problem, everyone talks about the problem of discrimination, the fact that some people can't get vaccinated or don't want to get vaccinated and therefore we'll have a two tier society. That's very true uh, and that is a problem. But my main concern is what vaccine passports will do to the whole idea of freedom, because what they will do, they will redefine the relationship between the individual and society. So there won't be a presumption of liberty. There won't be a presumption that you have the right to go about your daily business as you see fit with no interference whatsoever. Instead, you will have to prove that you are a clean person. You will have to prove that you are a good person, that you are a healthy person before you can enjoy everyday freedoms. And that is a papers please society. That is a society in which you have to show your papers, in which you essentially have to get a permission slip from the government in order to engage your civil liberty. And so for me, it's, it's the long-term redefinition off the relationship between us and them, between the individual and the society he lives in. That to me is the biggest problem with these passports. Interesting. Rob, I wonder if I can come back to you. You've already mentioned, which I wanted us to move on to, uh, this kind of other uh, goalposts moving. You know, we, we seem to now be one hell of a long way away from the strategy to flatten the sombrero. You know, that was, uh, <laughs> that was the initial plan. Um, uh, it, it, we, we then saw, you know, it's now about the R rate. And then uh, Christmas, there was the U-turn, thanks to the new mutant strains. Back in January, the Prime Minister said that the route out of lockdown was getting the vulnerable vaccinated by like, late February. That's all happened. I mean, my worry here, uh, Rob, is that you'll always be able to find a new potential threat here. You know, there's always going to be a potential new mutant variant of this virus. So I, I don't know how it ever, ever ends. Or do you remain confident, Robert, that actually on June the 21st, perhaps with a few weeks of having to show a QR code at the bar or if you're going to a sporting event, we will be back to the old normal? Or has that gone forever, Robert? I really, I really hope, hope, hope so. Um, and not least because my birthday is on June 23rd um, and I'd you know, quite like to uh, <laughs> celebrate it properly. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got holidays booked um, in the UK, obviously. I think the um, yeah I I think I mean the, what the, the 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 sort of the the kind version of this is that what is driving this is the determination that this needs to be the last lockdown that the you know that the Tory party the country will not wear this the economy will not wear this again so that, you know so you so you, you you try and put everything you can in place you know for for that to you know to to keep to keep the you know, to keep your foot on the disease's throat. Um, I think you know. I, I think at the moment, um, as you as you said, you know, you said the, um, you know, the, I am I I can't like many others. I can't quite work out why we're taking so long to get back 
get back to normal. I mean, I think there's a, you know, having the dates does help people with their planning. Um, you know, companies not, not, not in, in particular, but yeah, it's not, I mean, Suzanne is right in the sense of like, you know, the, 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 I say again, data, not dates, but actually it's dates, not data. Uh, seems to be the uh, seems to be the the situation. But that said, you know, this is such a complicated, messy, messy situation. And I think, and you, Suzanne, like, you know, I don't, I'm not entirely, you know, it's it's probably not not wise to say given what the industry meant. I'm not entirely certain of what I'm saying. I think you know, Suzanne's completely right. Brendan's completely right. The government has it like when you give governments powers, they tend to want to keep them. Um, yeah. You know, they can tend to they get a customer doing doing stuff. But I think on balance, we are probably heading we are heading towards more freedom rather than less. And I'm hoping that the uh, the, the passports are you know a temporary a, a temporary measure and a, a, a temporary a, a temporary blip. Well, that's that's the issue, isn't it? What's that saying? There's nothing so permanent as a temporary government measure, and uh, and that that is my my worry actually. And I think we're saying we're assuming this is going to be the last lockdown. We we don't know that personally. I would like to see no more lockdowns enshrined in law going forward. So I said right at the beginning in March last year that if lockdowns go on for too long, they are going to end up killing more people than COVID does. Um, now, obviously, we haven't got the statistics on that yet. I think we will. And I actually stand by that prediction. There was a report out today, a global report by the Pew Research Centre, suggesting that the middle classes globally have um, shrunk by some 150 million people as a result of these lockdowns directly. Now, we know poverty kills. We know that uh, people have lost businesses. We know that there's a mental health epidemic. We know that more people have killed themselves. Um, we know that there are 10 million people now on the UK NHS waiting list who, who can't get treatment and are potentially looking at uh, possibly uh, illnesses such as terminal cancer that had they had a screening program, had they been caught, those people could have been saved. It, it is deeply worrying. Um, I ju just by, if I may just, Mark, just pick up on one thing that, that Brendan said, which I thought was very interesting about this whole episode, um, uh, reforming the relationship between the individual and society. Another thing that concerns me is that vaccine passports in particular are reordering the relationship and the freedom and control we are allowed to have over our own bodies. It's always been a fundamental democratic right that we have control over our own bodies, that we have the right to accept or refuse medical treatment, and that there should be no coercion, just informed consent. I'm deeply worried with the advent of vaccine passports and the threat of removal from society that we are also lo losing autonomy, medical autonomy over how we treat our own bodies. We've already done that through lockdown. I can't go to the gym, I can't go swimming. Uh, I put on weight, I'm less fit. It's not been any good for my health. Um, and, you know, I want, want all the treatment that I have to be informed consent and not done as a result of coercion. Brendan, I want to come back to you uh, because uh, you know, I appreciate you're motivated by the, the kind of freedom uh, approach to this and the relationship between the individual and the state. But just on a, on a public health basis, we're going to put up a, a slide on the, the, the YouTube um, screen at the moment. <coughs> Do you think we've got into a problem where for a man with a hammer, every problem is a nail? And... I don't want to suggest I'm no medical expert. Perhaps there will be some ghastly third wave. I just don't know. But on Saturday, 10 people died from COVID. On, a, on an average day, 46 times more people, let's say about 460, mm -hmm. die from heart and circulatory disease in an average day. About 450 people, let's say 45 times as many, uh, die from cancer. Now, I appreciate that you've got, with regard to COVID, something that's transmissible. It's infectious. You can, uh, you, you don't catch cancer from one another. But nevertheless, Brendan, do you think we've now got into a situation where the political elite and the media are sort of only focused on that relatively short bar graph of ten people? And uh, we're, we're losing sight of wider health concerns and indeed trade off effects. If you keep the economy locked down, incomes fall, mental health problems rise. Uh, God knows what the backlog is for cancer diagnosis and this sort of stuff. Have we just become tunnel vision on COVID as if there's no other sort of health issue amongst the nation that really matters? Yes, we have. And. I say that as someone who is very much not a COVID denier. Nothing winds me up more than those cranks who say there's no such thing as COVID or it's just the flu or it's an invention or whatever else they say, because I think they really do harm to my side of the argument, which is to say that COVID is a very real virus. It's 
probably the worst pandemic in any living person's memory. It's, it's very, very serious indeed. Um, and it was right that certain measures would be taken to deal with it, particularly when there were spikes. I would have preferred if those measures had been voluntary rather than written into law, precisely because uh, I think these things do have a, a, a tendency to linger. And when governments accrue so much power, they're quite reluctant to give it back. Um, but it's a very serious problem. But I, even so, I do think we've become incredibly myopic. We've been become obsessed with COVID-19 to the detriment of every other issue, every other health issue, every other economic issue, every other social issue, even to the detriment of children's education, which um, got uh, society traditionally considered to be one of the most important endeavors that we can engage in. All of these things were either pushed to one side or completely undermined and forgotten about for nearly a year. And I think that is a problem. And that speaks to something I think that existed before COVID-19, which was a culture of fear, a culture of apocalypticism, this tendency to see things not simply as genuine challenges that we have to confront, but as almost the end of the world. And the way in which people have spoken about COVID-19, you would think it was the end of days, you would think it was an Armageddon. People talk about nature punishing mankind and all these, uh, Prince Harry even said something like that, all this kind of nonsense. And this, this tendency to see everything in these fearful terms means that we often ditch our rationalism. And I think that has happened over the past year. We have not been rational and reasoned in the way we've talked about and dealt with COVID-19. And I think the consequences of that will be severe. They will be severe economically, socially, and in terms of people's health. And I hope that as we come out of this, if we come out of it, that we will have an honest discussion about the damage that was done by lockdown and the damage that was done by restricting people's freedom. Because unless we look at um, the past year in the round, we won't learn the real lessons of what happened. Absolutely. Uh, Robert and then Suzanne, let me come to you for your uh, closing thoughts before I bring in our last two guests. Brendan, stay with us. Robert, let me start with you. Are, are we sort of seeing that, uh, you know, in public discourse and political debate, we can only focus apparently on one issue at a time and that just colours everything else. You know, we had sort of Brexit for four years. That's now disappeared, dealt with. Now we've got COVID or so nothing else is discussed about uh, even even around health issues, you know, nowhere near the agenda. Uh, do you think we've got into a problem in which we are just a sort of a narrative in the public discourse and political debate means that we sort of put all of our eggs and effort into one particular basket. We might carry that basket sensibly or badly, but I mean, nothing else. You'll know this running a think tank as, as I do. If you're not talking about COVID at the moment, there's almost no interest yeah. in any topic you're talking uh, uh, about. Yeah. Yeah, and likewise, we, we basically sort of shut down, for, well, not shut down, but we just, like, there were large phrases of the Brexit debate where there's just no point talking to anyone about anything else um, or, you know, putting out papers on any, any of the other problems our, our society faces. I think, I mean, yes, I think it's, it's you know, yeah, I mean, COVID has just, yeah, has swallowed, swallowed everyone's attention um, and um, has obscured or indeed in helped cause I mean, a, a wide variety of other, you know, there is going to be a political long COVID. There's going to be a host of things that happen happened in the last year that we need to then spend you know multiple years years fixing i think and i but i think but another aspect of this which again speaks to what brendan was saying is um, you know we are one of the problems with this this, this version of the news is that we are massively drawn to catastrophe and disaster like our our hind brains like if there's all i i my book, uh, The Great Acceleration, available all ETC, um, has, has, a, has a whole thing about how, like, if you say to, if you say to someone the world is going to get worse, you sound clever. If you say to someone the world is going to get better, you sound like an idiot. Like, if you if you literally take the same book review and just replace all the nice adjectives with nasty adjectives, people judge it as sounding more intelligent. Um, you know, you know, the the, he the, the headline in any new, there's a really good um, exercise. Um, I can't remember in a book I just read, and I can't remember what it is, which is like um, saying that um, what if you took it like a, a ten-year newspaper or a twenty-five-year newspaper or fifty newspaper, your headline would be every single day three hundred thousand people escape from poverty or whatever you know whatever your headline would be you know actually like the, actually we didn't manage to nuke each other in the Cold War well done humanity you know, there, you know the, the headlines will be a lot nice a lot better and easier if you actually just sort of step back and look but good news doesn't sell good news doesn't get any like you know, capitalism and the free market has lifted 
uh, billions of people out of poverty. It's been like it's the most extraordinary story of human prosperity and prospering, and it gets absolutely no attention and no credit for it because everyone just focuses on on bad stuff. Big difference between facts and news, of course, and big difference between old and news. You know, certain established truths aren't covered in the news. Robert, it's been lovely to have you with us. Thanks very much for joining us. I hope we can meet in a pub before too long. And, um, um, hopefully just, without just, just, just before I go, um, I, I have this for your your section on woke uh, woke woke nurseries. I have this lovely book, um, uh, which is an a, 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 an A to Z of of of, um, of left wing activists, uh, which of course Z is for Zapatista. So, there you go. So do, put, put, it, put this on the curriculum uh, as, as soon as we can. A is for activists. God Almighty, it looks absolutely ghastly. Suzanne, your, your last thoughts. Do you think the political class is now being shown to be completely inept at judging risk? I mean, this is a criticism made of people in general, not politicians in particular. We've always had this whole issue around blood clots. If you take the AstraZeneca jab, I, again, I'm not a scientist. I can't speak to that, what might be causing it. Um, but on the face of it, the statistics don't look uh, particularly uh, horrifically risky. Uh, I was reading an online article earlier saying that if you have the AstraZeneca jab, uh, your chances of getting a blood clot having taken that jab are less than being dealt a natural royal flush in poker, less than being involved in a shark attack, less than being struck by lightning, less than a pregnant woman having quadruplets. Do you think, Suzanne, that we've lost sort of any ability to look at hard numbers? All the policymaking is sort of sentimental or focused on a particular theme rather than actually crunching through the particular numbers and the trade-offs. Well, I know you're about to cut me off, Mark, but goodness me, there's so much to talk about there. We could talk about the, the, the gender bias in medical ethics with regard to the vaccine, but oh my goodness, so how do I end? I, I think one of the biggest problems that we, we've had throughout this last year is the lack of ability uh, on behalf of the media and the opposition to ask the questions that needed to be asked. And of course, I'm excluding people like Brendan O'Neill, who've done fabulous work challenging the narrative on this. But that, I think, has been one of the most biggest disappointments to me, is that uh, the, the media, all those journalists appearing at press conferences, focused, as, as Robert was saying, completely on COVID to the detriment of anything else, didn't ask the right questions. And that is why I think we are in the risk of our state that we were in. Every time the Conservative government came out and said they were going to do a measure. The opposition, instead of saying, well, hang on a minute, what kind of impact will this have on the wider NHS, on our children's education? Uh, they said, you're not doing it hard enough or fast enough. And yeah, so to answer your first question, I think, I think, unfortunately, the political class has been shown to be extremely inept. Suzanne, lovely to have you with us, albeit only virtually. Look forward to catching <laughs> up for a proper drink or a meal before too long fingers Fabulous. crossed fingers crossed uh, enjoy your rest of your evening Suzanne been great to have you with us Brendan please do stay with us I'm going to introduce our final two guests just going to quickly get their thoughts on uh, this issue uh, from the home team warm welcome to Saeed Kamal Lord Kamal uh, thank, thank you. you for gracing us with your presence sir uh, Saeed is the acting academic and research director here at the Institute of Economic Affairs and making her long awaited for live with Littlewood debut is Emma Webb, Deputy Research Director at the Free Speech Union. Good evening to you, Emma. How are you keeping? Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Um, Emma, let me start with you. What, what do you make of, very briefly, where we've got to in this, in this COVID uh, episode, this pandemic episode? I've been throwing sort of stats around that might imply the war is over. You know, we've, we've pretty much cracked it now. Obviously, we've got to keep rolling out the vaccine programme, but you know, the, the, the death count is falling and falling and falling. Hospitals are not overwhelmed. Let's snap back to normal. Uh, no need for these vaccine passports on a practical level, quite apart from the civil liberties issues. Where are you on this? Am I being too reckless here? Or is it time to say, thankfully, this episode's behind us. Let the old normal return. Unfortunately, I think my main concern is not with the virus, but with our reaction to the virus. Um, I agree with almost everything, possibly everything that Suzanne has, has just said. My main concern is uh, to do with the vaccine passports and the, the uh, precedent that sets in terms of uh, bodily autonomy and the relationship between the individual and the state. And so my main concerns are around um, not only in, in relation to the, the storage of data and where that might lead us in terms of um, 
the use of medical records and so on, but primarily with um, issues to do with discrimination and um, the ethics of the vaccine passports. I think it sets a very dangerous precedent. And I'm actually quite horrified that we're even discussing it. I, I think... Um, that it's it's more worrying <laughs> worrying than the vaccine itself, particularly because even just simply on from a rational perspective, if the vaccination is uh, useful enough, works well enough, um, then or to put it the opposite in the opposite direction, if the vaccine doesn't work well enough for the vaccinated to be around the unvaccinated, once all of the vulnerable people in society have been vaccinated, then it's not safe for the vaccinated to be around the vaccinated. And so the, um, the, the consequences of having vaccine passports is completely um, disproportionate to the, the, the level of risk. It doesn't make any logical sense. And I think the costs of that are um, tremendously high. I find that more worrying than anything at all. So what's your take on this? You, you, you said on the conservative benches in the Lords. So, you know, you're on the face of it, a supporter of the government, but it's also, you know, your job there and here, of course, to, to hold them to account. H haven't we haven't we just sort of lost sight of the big picture here? I mean, I don't want to be flippant and say the whole thing's over. Clearly, there are people dying every day and getting sick every day of this disease. But I mean, the trajectory is just spectacular. And if, as Emma says, these vaccines are all they cracked up to be, and early evidence seems to be they're more impressive than the initial modelling said, uh, why, why do I have to drink here? Why can't I go around the corner and have a pint? Well, Mark, you and I have had these conversations before. You're quite more gung-ho than I am. I'm quite, quite often more uh, precautionary, as it, as it were. Not, oh, I mean, I hope not over-precautionary. Um, and I think, I think, I mean, I'm actually... I'm, while I'm concerned about government-initiated passports, I'm more relaxed about landlords and others exercising their property rights. You know, and if, if a landlord wants to say, I only want to let vaccinated people in, then I'm not that, I, I don't get that worked up about it. I think they're exercising their property rights, that, that it should be up to them who they let into their pub. And there'll be other pubs that say, anyone, anyone is welcome. So I'm far more relaxed about this rather than a government, I wouldn't want to see a government uh, passport vaccination or certification scheme, but I would leave it to individual uh, property owners exercising their rights. Just to press you that on, on that, Saeed, yeah, I, I, could, I could see that case from a kind of libertarian property rights case, but the landlords should have to pay for their own database, right? That's not being paid for by the taxpayer. If the dog and duck down the road want to construct some system of working out whether or not I've had a vaccine, fine, but that's coming out of their till, not out of my tax dollars, correct? Sure, and you and you and you could be right here because the problem, because I, my assumption was that when when we you know you and I have had our first uh, uh, jab, um, we get a little piece of paper um, and it shows that. Don't we've mention that Rob will get even more paranoid yeah, yeah. about the IA being ahead of the CPS on. Well, this I'm one. I'm older than Rob, so I fall into that over <laughs> over over fifties category. So there's no special treatment in my case. It might have been for you, but not for me. Um, so. Um, now, of course, it's easily forgeable, those, 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 little, those little pieces of card. But, you know, it's a proxy for determining who's had the vaccine. And I, and I think if a landlord says, you know, I, I'm only going to let people who, who are vaccinated, I'm quite relaxed about that. Brendan, just before we move on to our final topic, let, let me uh, bring you back in. You've been a regular on this show, and I keep, I keep asking myself and you often, when is people's patience going to run out? Um, this has been sort of going on for a year or so. If people want their freedom back, it, it does seem uh, we in the UK have been extraordinarily compliant with very strict measures, stricter measures than many people are under in Western Europe, where they actually have, at least at the moment, a much bigger problem. Do you think we're just going to meekly surrender to whatever Boris Johnson, this government and the political bureaucracy impose upon us? Or is there a point when people start snapping and saying this is absurd, you know, fewer people are dying of COVID than being struck by lightning and yet I can't go and visit my dear old mum in a care home for more than half an hour or I can't, uh, you know, I can't have 100 people at my wedding. With this up, I will not put. Because, wow, after more than a year of it, we still have not crossed that point. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. The question of compliance and whether it's compliance or social solidarity and people feeling like they're doing something for society, I think it might be a mix of all of those things. Um, but it does it has concerned me at different points over the past year. I think Robert Dingwall, uh, who's on stage, I think he had a good point when he said the government has almost been too successful in its campaign of terror because 
he said that early on, particularly in March and April and May last year, the government used the politics of fear very consciously to try and force people to comply to the, with the lockdown. Um, they terrorized us. They, you know, we were constantly being told this was um, absolutely lethal. If you left your house, you could potentially kill someone. People of all ages could die. We now know that that is simply not true. It's far more likely to be old people. Um, so they used fear. They used fear to force compliance. And I think that could have long-term detrimental impacts because it has uh, caused atomization and concern and uh, the breaking down of public life. I think one of the most depressing things of the past year has been the uh, collapse of public life, the way we were all forced into our own homes. We weren't in the pubs having reasoned conversations with each other. We weren't around the water cooler or whatever the modern equivalent is in the workplace where you, you know, develop your ideas and share your ideas and, and venture your controversial points of view. All those areas of public life in which people start to develop a sense of questioning and sometimes a sense of resistance. All of those areas disappeared and people were at home on their own and their only role was to watch the daily press conference and get really scared about how many people had died. So that process, the way in which the government opted for a campaign of fear, rather than galvanizing the public to work together to tackle COVID-19, that was one of the worst mistakes it made because it basically said, people of Britain, you are potential disease carriers, stay home, rather than saying, you are decent, good citizens who could contribute to the effort to tackle COVID-19. And that, I think, will have long-term consequences in, in, in terms of compliance and people's fear of engaging in public life in the way they used to. Thank you. Stay with us all. We're going to move on to our, our last topic. Is Britain institutionally racist? To what extent is Britain a racist country? Now, this is last week's news, but it's a recurring theme. The particular report I'm going to refer to is last week's news. But every day there's some angle uh, on this particular story. Uh, the widely recovered, uh, widely covered report last week was from the Commission on Race uh, uh, and Ethics, uh, now dubbed the Sewell Report after the Commission's head, Dr Tony Sewell. Uh, we got a picture of that report just coming up on the, the screen now. Uh, the conclusion was, no, there isn't institutional racism. That's not to say there is no racism in Britain, to be clear, but it's, it's not an institutional feature. There was an enormous backlash. A lot of the backlash uh, from certain quarters was criticised on the grounds that people had not read the full report. I must confess, I haven't read the whole report, only the media coverage around it. But Emma, what did you make of this? Was this a breath of fresh air? We can relax and sit back. Uh, that's not to say there are no problems with racism, but institutional racism isn't really a problem. Do you think they got that bang on right? And what are the uh, complainants uh, who believe institutional racism exists? What do you think they feel is missing from this report? And have they got a point at all? It's a huge breath of fresh air, um, partly because it, completely contrary to what it's being criticised for, it, it actually takes the politics out of the discussion and takes the temperature in the room down some slightly by taking a very measured level-headed um, and evidence-based approach to issues that have become very heated since June last year mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense yes it is a massive breath of fresh air but the people who are objecting to it and who are criticizing it regardless of whether they've read it or not were always going to criticize it because there is an entire industry now that is you know a, a real gravy train for some people mm -hmm. charging in the ten, uh, tens of thousands of pounds for unconscious bias training and things like that, um, that are dependent on us perpetuating the hysteria and the moral panic around institutional racism, institutional other things as well, like institutional misogyny. So uh, the, these people are always going to criticise the report. And in fact, in the um, Runnymede Trust has just um, put up a on its website, an open letter that has been signed by and all of the people that you, you might expect it to be signed by. Um, and I'm sure it will be joined by people like Professor Kinde Andrews, who has been particularly um, loud about his criticisms of this, as everyone would have expected him to be. Um, and in, in, in that letter itself, actually, they say that um, they knew from the beginning, before they had even seen the report, that this was going to be, you know, 
towing the government line and so on. So what they were essentially admitting to there, possibly without realising it, is they were admitting to the fact that they would have disagreed with this report no matter what, because they disagree with the people who are, t- who are contributing to the report, the commissioners, because those commissioners don't take the exact line that they would like them to take. And therefore, they've tarred them as being unacademic, as, as lacking rigour, when in fact, it's a perfectly evidence-based, rigorous, level-headed and reasonable approach. And the reason why they're going for it, obviously, is because it in- undermines the uh, entire grift that some of these people are on. And do you think, Amber, that's what it's come to? It is, uh, it, there is a kind of racism industry now, and therefore you get perverse incentives. If you work in the campaign to end racism, your job depends on racism existing, right? But, uh, it's, a, it's a common problem in all government programs, right? If you're mm-hmm. given a particular problem to tackle, then uh, you, you, know, you, you keep saying the problem's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, even subconsciously. Maybe these people need to go on unconscious bias training do you think that's really it, that, that we've just allowed this industry to grow up, which is now defending a vested interest? Yeah, I think that there are um, certain movements, not just um, in this area, but in many others as well, that have ca- at some point campaigned um, for good things, you know, the civil rights movement. Um, and then eventually um, the people who are wedded for whatever reason to um, particular movements have to keep finding something else once those problems are solved and so the problem with institutional racism as an idea and the the report actually doesn't deny that institutional racism exists it it does they do believe that it can exist in some situations but just not that British society is institutionally Mm -hmm. racist is that the idea of institutional racism can't be proved or disproven empirically it's a set of goggles that you wear to look at society it's the same with as I said systemic misogyny or systemic anything else and so an entire worldview is essentially undermined when the evidence is presented contrary to this and anything that is uh, proposed in contradiction to this idea that is is held you know by people it's a, it's a it's a it's a very um emotional subject for some people um and many of the people who ascribe to it do so because in some senses the road to hell is paved with good intentions um and and they do want to make a difference and they do want to um ally themselves with people who are at a disadvantage but what this report finds is that not all racial disparities are explained through systemic racism it doesn't deny that there are um racial disparities and if you want to take a serious look at how to deal with racial disparities and to look at equality in society, then you should take an evidence-based approach because that's the only way that you can actually propose reasonable solutions to these problems rather than setting up a kind of fantasy understanding of the world that can't really be dealt with other than through revolution, tearing down all of our institutions and reforming society in a kind of revolutionary way, which is obviously an inherently unconservative way to view the world and um, way to propose how to change the world. And so this was a point that um, one of the commissioners, Mercy Moroki, made, who, who's herself, as, as many of the others, have been um, horribly attacked with ad hominem arguments from their uh, detractors. She made the point that lazy generalizations don't actually result in real change. And so that's why I think this report is such a breath of fresh air, because it's actually making some proposals that, you know, there's a reason there's a reason why certain people are angry about this report. Um, And I think it's partly because they're offering real solutions rather than revolutionary change. Lloyd, what's your take? Has this report nailed the nature and extent of racism in British society, which it doesn't claim doesn't exist? And actually, Emma does correct me quite rightly, it doesn't even say institutional racism doesn't exist, just it's not endemic across society. Is this a breath of fresh air that allows us to be laser focused on the on actually tackling racism where we find it rather than seeing it uh, everywhere? Or is this just another report that will, you know, have a media splash for 24 hours and uh, but then we'll be shelved and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to uh, seeing racism everywhere and the racism industry, even if it has some good points, might be prone to exaggerate in certain instances? 
Yeah, I'm not sure yet because I haven't made my way completely through it. I'm still reading it. And as, as Emma says, there's a lot of evidence. And, it's, and that's what I think one of the really positive things about the report. And what it's trying to do is identify where there might be racism and what, and what the causes of those problems are. And is it due to racism or is it due to another reason, like socioeconomic reasons or class reasons or poverty, for example? And I've also been reading the reactions. And I think what's really interesting about the reactions is that they kind of fall down in some way, they mirror sort of what you would call sometimes a left-right debate of the status versus individuals. So if you're quite status collectivist, you think the whole society, you know, the whole society is racist and endemically racist, and therefore we have to do something about it versus sort of individualists who will say, yes, there is racism, and the Saul report identifies it here, here, and here. That's where we should laser focus on tackling racism. Or it's also a, a difference between people who believe, you know, I used to have these debates with my friends on the left about how you tackle racism. Some of them would say, oh no, you go on marches, you wave flags, you know, and, and you, you, you make a loud noise and people have to listen. My view was what you have to do is try and break down barriers, you know. So when I got elected, I became the first non-white leader of a political group in the European Parliament. And I thought by being here and just by standing up, the racists won't like it, but hopefully I'll be laying a path for others to follow. Now, I, I get criticised for that because sometimes by some of my friends on the left, but other friends on the left say, yes, we want to see you know, people, black Asians and other people uh, from ethnic minorities in all the political parties, because that's the way we're, we're, we're going to break it down. So I think what I think people had already made up their mind. And if they were suspicious of the Tories or had really decided um, you know, uh, structural racism uh, already existed, then they were not very happy that this report didn't come to that conclusion. And I've been, I've been looking up, um, trying to really grasp what institutional racism means. And I know it goes back to Stokely Carmichael and the Black Panther movement. And what's interesting is you see some of those debates about it. One of the uh, critics of the Sewell Report actually says um, that he criticizes Sewell for obsessing about defining institutional racism. Now, surely if you're going to claim there's institutional racism, you, you should try and define it before you can decide whether you've got it or not. But some of the critics have already decided that there is institutional racism. And if you can't come to that conclusion, you're wrong. Brendan, what's your take on this? Is this the first uh, bolt fired back in the kind of identity politics war? We're going to start, thanks to this report, judging people by the content of their character rather than the colour of their skin. Not pretending that racism doesn't exist anywhere in British society, uh, but, but taking a more sophisticated approach to it rather than necessarily seeing it everywhere and seeing it as institutional everywhere? Or is this just uh, uh, another spat in the culture wars, nothing will change? I think it's actually a very important moment, or I hope it will be an important moment. I think Tony Sewell has done an excellent service to this country and the, the abuse he has received over the past week has been genuinely shocking. Um, you know, nothing has convinced me more that racism is still a problem than, than the abuse that Tony Sewell has received on, on the internet and elsewhere. He's been called an Uncle Tom and worse. He's been compared to Joseph Goebbels, which is not only racist, but also um, anti-Semitic to use that kind of, those kinds of comparisons. So um, the abuse he's received, I think, demonstrates uh, Emma's point, which is that there is a group of people out there, and uh, an institution, one might say, um, who are dependent on the idea that Britain is a horrible racist country. They depend on that idea for their moral authority, their funding, um, their power in society, you know, the race relations industry, large sections of the public sector, um, large se sections of the educational establishment. They, they all have bought into the idea of institutional racism and bought into the idea of themselves as these enlightened ones who have to give the rest of us unconscious bias training and clean out our brains and correct our thoughts. So I think the problem at the moment is, is with anti-racism. Anti-racism was one of the great causes of the 20th century and earlier, one of the great noble causes which has uh, advanced humankind to such an extraordinary degree. Um, and it, it, it's something that I actually was involved in very early on when I was very young. I, campaigned against um, what I consider to be racist immigration laws. I'm very pro-immigration, I'm very liberal on immigration, and Britain had uh, immigration laws at the time which were pretty explicitly racist, and that was one of the campaigns I was involved in. And so I was drawn to anti-racism because I considered it a very humanist, progressive cause, progressive in the good sense rather than the bad sense. 
Um, but what anti-racism has become more recently is very much uh, a self-serving institution. And it is now not about advancing uh, ethnic minorities, but it's about policing society more broadly. And actually often the new forms of anti-racism end up rehabilitating racism because they encourage us to think racially all the time. Uh, ideas like critical race theory present all white people as being privileged, which completely ignores class differences. They present, it presents all black people as being victims, weighed down upon by the burden of history and the burden of oppression. And it constantly says that we have to be careful how we engage with people from different races. We have to think about their experiences. You have to watch your words it basically rehabilitates a kind of segregationist mindset. And that's not what anti-racism is supposed to do. That's certainly not what anti-racism was uh, designed to do. So I think the response to this report is, is very interesting indeed, because I think the so-called anti-racist elites, they feel very exposed by this report because it has uh, exposed some of their claims and some of their arguments, and that's why they're lashing out. I hope it will give rise to a, a, a genuine, honest discussion about how much Britain has progressed on the issue of race and what work remains to be done. And that work should be done by people like Tony Sewell, who I think has um, ethnic minority people's best interests at heart, rather than by the self-serving woke elites. Emma, this week uh, there was new guidance issued for nursery schools by the Early Years Coalition. This mm -hmm. guidance was developed with representatives from education unions, various Early Years development groups, and it suggests that playgroup teachers, quote, need an understanding about white privilege so toddlers can learn to, quote, recognise racist behaviours and develop, develop anti-racist views. This is only guidance. It's not, it's not a government edict. I should be clear on that. This isn't legislation brought forward by the government. But that seems rather at odds with these reports' conclusions. Is, is that really the best way to tackle the racism that does exist in the United Kingdom? Yeah, very, very much at odds. Um, the it's I mean, it's actually astounding that this has been suggested and as you say you know the department for education hasn't endorsed this uh guidance i think that it probably it would be uh in in contrary to uh the equality act you might hope um but certainly would probably conflict with the department for education's current guidance it is in conflict with this and um very much in the same way that i think many of the people who were involved in um producing this um report are people who would prefer to be judged by the content of their character than the, con the, the color of their skin, as you say. Uh, what this is really trying to do, this guidance, is to solve racism by teaching children to see race. Um, again, as with the unconscious bias training, which has been found not only to be ineffective, but actually in some cases to create bias by causing people to um, see stereotypes, I suppose you'd say. Um, what they're really trying to do is to, uh, it seems what they want to do is to teach uh, children, white children, that they are oppressors and ethnic minority children that they are oppressed, which is the absolute opposite to, as Brendan has said, racism's goal, which is empowerment. And um, to create an equal society, you have to see everyone equally. You have to judge people by the content of the character, not the content of their skin. So I really think that the suggestion that that should be taught to children under the age of five is um, abominable, actually. Um, I don't think that it could possibly be condemned enough. Um, and as you say, it has come just after this report has been released um, and is very much in line with the detractors, the views of the detractors of this report. So um, I hope that uh, no one will be taking up that guidance, but you never know. And does that worry you more generally, Emma, that what's being taught in the classroom, I say this is just guidance issued just for nursery schools, Um isn't sort of, I mean, maybe it shouldn't be set entirely by the Secretary of State for Education, right? But is there a danger that what youngsters are now being taught at schools is, in general, whether this guidance flies or, 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 or sinks without trace, is at odds with genuinely mm -hmm. encouraging a colorblind society? 
I think it's very concerning that there are some activist groups that clearly think that children are the new front in the culture war. Uh, and that's the way to sort of win over the future generation to their way of thinking. It's an issue more broadly, I think, to do with the politicization of institutions and education in particular, rather than just in, in relation to um, the, the the question of systemic racism. So, yeah, I think it's extremely worrying, but it's also quite predictable because um, people who want to win generations over to an activist cause, as we saw in, uh, although it's a bit of an extreme uh, analogy to draw, in Mao's Cultural Revolution, they went for the students first. Um, and so it's hardly surprising, I think. Said uh, uh, and Brendan, let me finish with you. Said, l- last year you hosted an IA webinar with Ben Bradley, uh, the Conservative MP for Mansfield, and our very own Christopher Snowden, our head of lifestyle economics here, on the forgotten demographic. This was a question of whether actually the people that were presently falling through the cracks or being failed by society's infrastructure at the moment were typically white working class boys. Do you think, uh, we'll make sure we put a, a, a link to that in the, in the show notes on YouTube, but um, whether the data tells us that or not, say, do you think there's now a danger that everybody's compartmentalised? You know, you, you've got to be talking about groups either of black people or Asian extraction or white working class boys or, um, you know, black gay women or whatever it might be, rather than actually trying to judge people as individuals. It's sort of everything has to be in a pigeonhole everybody's experiences has to be seen through an identity, some of which they may have chosen for themselves, some of which they may have been born into. Yeah, I mean, I think what was what was reassuring about the, that debate that I hosted or the discussion I hosted with Ben Bradley was that he wasn't saying, you know, now we should uh, uh, help only white working class boys and it's terrible that we're helping other minorities. What he actually said was, you know, it shouldn't be about pitching one ethnic group against another. It should be about helping everyone of low attainment to, to do better and to achieve more in, in society. And that was a positive discussion. But what was interesting was the reaction to some of that. People still, you know, the critics still piled in and said, oh, you're only focusing on, you know, what about black people? What about Asian kids? And as if, as if they were dismissing those concerns. Um, so what Ben and others were saying was, don't forget about white working class boys, but it doesn't mean it's either or. We should be helping everyone who's got low attainment. And sometimes it's from because of socioeconomic factors. Sometimes it's poverty. Sometimes it's other reasons. Sometimes it's lack of ambition. Sometimes they come from homes where the parents do not encourage them to be ambitious or they're snared upon or they don't have time to study or space to study. So lots of different reasons. What I do worry about is that how we are becoming compartmentalized. But what I'm optimistic about is when I remember talking to my father about what it was like to come to Britain in the 1950s and the racism he faced. And he would look at me and say, you have got far, Britain's still racist, but you've got far more opportunities. I now look at my sons and I can see how much better it is over 40 years. And what's interesting is when I talk to young people and they talk to me about microaggression, so initially I got a bit annoyed with them. I'd say, well, I'll tell you about aggression. That's been chased down the road with skinheads, with, by skinheads with knives. That's the sort of stuff I faced when I, I was younger. What you're talking about is not real aggression. But in some ways, it's positive that they're talking about microaggression because it shows how far we've come, that it's not as commonplace to see those racist attacks that I faced when I was younger. And, and you know, I think the best way to tackle this is actually in the school playground. You know, I grew up with mates who were different religions, different colours. We learnt about each other's cultures and our, our festivals. Sometimes we'd go to each other's homes and learn about that. And that's the best way to tackle it. And if you keep emphasising differences all the time, then I do worry that you keep emphasising differences rather than what we've got, got in common when we play football or cricket in the playground or, you know, we just hang out together. Brendan, let me finish with you. Is that the real risk here, that the more you emphasise difference on one particular area, the more you get a domino effect, the more people are defined as being uh, BAME, although I don't think we can use that terminology anymore. That's now considered to be uh, inappropriate. So the more you categorise people as being black, the more other people start categorising themselves as being white. And you actually get a much more divisive society because people then to start to react to it and form their own identity groups, whether that be on race, religion or or any other particular criteria. Is that what we're seeing emerging? And if so, how do we unravel that? I think that's exactly what's happening. I, I think we're witnessing the potential balkanisation of the UK along identity lines, which would be an absolute tragedy. And that's something really worth 
taking a stand against. I think in relation to the white working class boys discussion, as someone who used to be a white working class boy, <laughs> I'm still white, but the other stuff has now disappeared slightly. Um, I think the, the issue there is um, the, the demonization of that community, which I do think is quite specific. I mean, white working class boys are told that they are privileged, that they are probably inherently racist, that they come from uh, a, a very comfortable part of society, they've got nothing to worry about. And for many, many working class boys, that simply is not the case at all. Um, so I, I don't like the way they are singled out as the problematic identity, whereas other identities are seen as good. My preference is that we get over the issue of identity altogether, uh, come together as a community, as a, as a national community, which is why I think the vote for Brexit was so positive, because that was a yearning for a more national sense, for a, more, a, a stronger sense of social solidarity within the nation itself. Those kinds of things are more positive. But if you look at what happened at Pimlico Academy, for example, where students were tearing down the union flag, or if you look at the flat that Catherine Burblesen gets simply because she tries to educate many kids from ethnic minority backgrounds about Britain, about being uh, taking pride in Britain, you, you realize we face an uphill struggle because the identitarian elites or the identitarian sections of society are uh, uh, quite strong at the moment. But I think the key argument is that we've got to start thinking as a nation, we've got to start thinking about our shared interests and ditch this sectionalism and sectarianism, which is constantly pitting one community against another. Ladies and gentlemen, on that upbeat, uh, salutary note from Brendan. We've got to leave it there. We've overrun our time again, I'm afraid. Emma, Said, and Brendan, thank you very much indeed for joining me this thank evening. You. Been a pleasure speaking to you. My thanks to, to uh, our earlier guests, Robert Colville and Suzanne Evans. Thank you very much for watching us on YouTube. If you've enjoyed the show, please hit the thumbs up button. That helps with the YouTube algorithm. And if you're not yet a subscriber to the IEA London YouTube channel, you should be. So please hit subscribe and indeed the notification bell. That will tell you of our upcoming uh, events. I'm going to tell you about three of them now. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be back in this chair at 1pm to discuss whether we might be seeing a new Eurozone crisis uh, due to the way COVID is playing out. My guests will be Matthew Lynn and Julian Jessup to discuss that topic. On Tuesday the 13th of April at 6pm, my colleague Christopher Snowden will be in conversation with Matthew Saeed, the columnist, uh, pundit and commentator. And on Monday the 26th of April at 6pm, I will be in conversation with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, the Right Honourable Steve Barclay MP. So please do join us for those. You can find out more about those events at iea.org.uk or do the right thing and smash the subscribe button and the notification bell here. Thanks to all of my guests again for joining us. Thanks to all of you for watching us on YouTube. Stay safe, stay free, over and out.